You're watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. and by viewers like you. Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to part two of our meeting with one of those individuals who is truly helping to shape the Jewish future, Jack Rosen, chairman of the American Council for World Jewry, which assists Jewish communities outside the United States and Israel in improving their political access and impact. Jack Rosen, thank you again for joining us. Mark, thank you, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. You are personal friends with the Clintons, correct? Yes. Would you, did you hear anything from him? Did you ever have a conversation with President Clinton after Camp David when uh, Barack and Arafat seemed so close to a deal that then fell through? Is there anything, you know, we have, I've heard two different reports. One report is that Arafat at the last moment just said no to a deal which would have created a wonderful Palestinian state. The Palestinians argue that what Barack was giving was not one contiguous state, even let us set aside the issue of a right of return to Israel proper. But when it fell through, did you ever have a chance to talk to President Clinton? From his perspective, how much, you know, why did it fall apart? And does it say anything to you about what lessons now should be applied as we go forward from this point forward? But take us first back to 2000. Can you give us any light on that incident? Well, I think President Clinton is extremely disappointed that time ran out on him and uh, that uh, they never completed that process. Uh, and I think he, he's always, you know, I mean, blamed it. On, on Yasser Arafat and the political leadership. Um, uh, you know, we've had discussions about it before, so, you know, I, I mean, that's sort of the, the, the general viewpoint I've gotten from him on that. Uh, you know, one of the lessons out of this is, uh, you know, the, the take advantage of, uh, you know, the, the, the moments where you can, America can be, or American president can, can have more influence on a deal which is not at the end of your administration, but uh, somewhere before the end. I think, I think had President Clinton had more time, I, I, I think we would have had a better shot at it. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you okay. that we would have gotten there, but had he had more time, we would have had a better shot at it. But he does feel that the reports we heard, that it was Arafat's inability to accept the deal, which was responsible for the deal falling apart. Yes. Okay. And on the other hand, you know, um, I remember being with President Bush afterwards, uh, and uh, uh, he turned to me and he says, he says, I'll never talk to Arafat again. And I looked at him and said, how can you not talk to Arafat again? I mean, he's sort of the leader of the Palestinians. He says, he lied to me, and he says, I won't deal with him again. He never dealt with him again, I understand. So, uh, you know, I tell you that side, uh, that's a story, because, uh, you know, Arafat may just have been somebody who was willing to lie to presidents and could have been lying to President Clinton as well and then maybe President Clinton didn't have a time to kind of understand that and read that and but President Bush caught on to that early on. Now come up to the present with President Obama. What was your reaction to his speech in Cairo and the effort he tried to make to reach out to the Muslim world? Uh, look, I, I implored him for, tr for trying. I think, um, you know, he gave a sense of, of, of hope to the world that, you know, um, that there'd be some resolution to many of the problems of the world, especially those that may have, you know, involved, the, you know, the, the Muslim world. 
Um, and uh, he took the initiative early on, and I'm glad he did that. Uh, in retrospect, uh, it, it, you know, it has not worked out well, I think, because he made some, some, some promises, or it wasn't promises, but he, he, he got some expectations in the Arab world, and they think he didn't live up to it. Um, and, uh, you know, what looked like a moment of opportunity might just look like, uh, might have resulted in a moment where, you know, he, he did it too early uh, and hadn't prepared the Arab world for it. So, uh, in retrospect, I, 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 you know, I think he should have waited longer, bef you know, before making that particular speech and sort of worked on the underlying problems a little more. Would you have said that when he made the speech? No, because I, you know, I think we all thought uh, that you know he was he was a new president. He came with a message. He had a Muslim, you know, background that uh, you know was an opportune time for him. And uh, you know, I think he's made a real mistake in not not visiting Israel. Uh, you know, uh, uh, he, 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 I, I, I mean, I can imagine what the discussion may have been like in the White House. But hey, he visited both Jerusalem, you know, and 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 gone gone to Egypt at the same time and made two speeches, I think it would have been much more forceful. Mm -hmm. But I can see within the White House how maybe that wasn't going to happen easily. <laughs> to what extent is there, from your perspective, an internal conflict within the administration between President Obama's view of the Middle East, settlements, Israel's role in the problem, and that of Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State. The sense we get, Jack, is that Secretary of State Clinton doesn't see things quite the same way as the president does. At the same time, she is part of an administration, and her job is to execute the policy of the administration. But is there anything you can tell us about the way in which, for example, the president and the Secretary of State view settlement policy and whether the Secretary of State is as critical of Israel for its settlement policy as the President seems to be. I, I, at the time I happened to have been engaged a little bit in discussion with the White House and the Israeli government and, uh, and, and I think the expectation was here that, uh, that, that Abbas needed something to come to the table and I think the President made a mistake in, in publicly, okay, in publicly, you know, uh, 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 you know, taking this position that the Israelis had to stop the settlements and not asking Abbas to do anything. But it was a strategy for how to get him to the table. I don't think that necessarily defined mm -hmm. President Obama's position on settlements. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a mistake he made, uh, not only because it didn't result in peace talks, but I think it also resulted in a message around the world um, that uh, weakened Israel's position. I think that's been a problem that this administration is causing, which is you know, one of my concerns today in the, you know, the upcoming you know, UN resolution that the Palestinians have, which you know, is not so much uh, whether the U.S. Uh, you know, sh should find a resolution to, to you know, what the Palestinians... We should state this because as we're meeting today, the United Nations is considering a resolution which would call the Israeli settlements illegal, and they're asking the United States to go along with that resolution. Meanwhile, the American Jewish community is formally asking the president to make sure the United States vetoes that resolution. As you and I sit here, we don't know what's happening right now. Do you have an instinct about what's going to happen? Well, what, what we understand that the, uh, uh, the United States is, a, is kind of trying to you know, get the Security Council to agree to is a statement, um, you know, uh, calling upon the, you know, the end of new settlement construction going forward. What the Palestinians are calling for are a resolution condemning and calling the settlements illegal. I, I believe the U.S. would veto that resolution, but the U.S., because it doesn't want to be in a position to, to have to veto that, is trying to come up with a settlement. Of that, and that would be a statement which wouldn't have the same significance in international law. Um, would it be bad for Israel? I think it would be a bad message again uh, for Israel's position vis-a-vis -vis America. America's always looked like you know the the, the 
a, a strong partner, never abandoning Israel, and this could be taken as a, a message to the rest of the world that it's abandoning Israel. I don't think it is abandoning Israel if it takes that position, but, you know, optics is important in this, in, 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 in politics, uh, you know, anywhere around the world. So I think that, that that's problematic for that reason. Uh, it, of course, wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, t be something new. I mean, uh, uh, America took that position uh, in, in, in the Turkish fl Turkey flotilla incident, where it also, uh, you know, uh, refused to condemn Israel, mm -hmm. and, you know, for the fl flotilla uh, t uh, incident, but on the other hand, came up with a statement that was acceptable to all parties. So it wouldn't be laying any new ground. But I think, as I said, what, what I think President Obama has done in both his, his public discourse on settlements early on, now, you know, what, what could happen, in, in, you know, if he, if, if he doesn't veto this, well, if he comes up with some, uh, some compromise, compromise on this, right, is that it look like he's abandoning, you know, a friend. And he just looks like he abandoned Mubarak and he looks like he could abandon Israel. I just don't know that this is, this is good optics here for the rest of the world. In your mind, would it be an abandonment of Israel? No, I don't think it's an abandonment of Israel. I, I think, uh, it, it, again, from the perspective of most of the world, and I think, you know, from the perspective of this administration, I think most Americans um, and most Israelis, as you said, I, 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 I think uh, uh, they would agree that, that the, the continued, you know, uh, uh, construction of new settlements would be something that uh, is, is problematic in the peace process. And uh, I think most Israelis would agree that there shouldn't be any new expansion of settlements. So it's not new ground, you know, we always like, you know, we, we, within the Jewish community, a split on, on policy and ideology is acceptable. You know, people on the left and on the right, some favor settlements, some don't favor settlements. The minute, a, you know, some non-Jewish politician takes a, a contrary position, you know, we usually get all nervous and excited. So, so we, we shouldn't take the president's position on settlements um, or even the world's position on settlements is something that, uh, you know, doesn't require compromise in moments. But the optics is so important to an Arab world that, that, that uh, looks like it's, it's getting stronger and more influential. Why? Which would be problematic. It would be problematic because, you know, it, it means that I, that I think that they think that uh, their position is strengthening. Why should they necessarily, you know, come to the peace table? So, Jack, what would your suggestion be to the president in this dilemma? I think he's got a strong arm, a lot of folks in the Security Council, so uh, it's not the only veto. I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I think just as he, you know, he, 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 he was able to successfully get the uh, Iran sanctions through, I think he has to find ways to get some more support on the Security Council. You know, it's going to be difficult. It may be impossible, but that's, I think, what he has. To do. do you still believe in the United Nations? Uh, look, uh, I think we need an institution that, that, you know, presents a platform for the world body to talk as opposed to fight. And um, uh, would, I, would I somehow find a, a, a new, you know, process, a new type of institution? Yeah, I'd love to be able to do that if we could. Uh, the UN is unwieldy and uh, the Security Council doesn't necessarily represent, uh, you know, the, 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 the leading nations of the world anymore. Uh, so um, uh, it would be nice to start all over. But if we can't start all over, it's better than nothing. Okay. By the way, you are currently the chairman and past president of the American Jewish Congress, which seems to have come to an end. Why did it happen? Well, it hasn't come to an end yet. Um, I think the American Jewish Congress suffers from, from, from the same, you know, difficulties that many, you know, uh, Jewish organizations do who have been around a long time, continue to fight the same wars, um, and, and uh, has a sort of a bureaucracy in place that uh, wants to maintain, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that confrontation on, on yesterday's wars. And I always I used to say to folks in American Jewish Congress, look, we won the church-state battle. We're, we're, we ought to be in the maintenance business now. But there's still, you know, we're, we're, 
we're, we're folks who wanted to continue to support a battle that we won already. And I think uh, American Jew Jewry got tired of it. I think the staff got tired of it. And I think the supporters got tired of it. And I'll be honest with you, even I got tired of it. Yeah, I'm the ch you know, I got the title chairman, uh, which means I'm not the sort of you know, chief operating officer. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, uh, this is a problem we have in, 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 in American institutions, including Jewish uh, institutions, that, uh, you know, there, there's a point at which you have to say, look, the old wars and old battles are something that, you know, we have to approach differently, and if we won, let's raise the victory flag, and let's not just maintain these battles. And I think American Jewish Congress did that for too long. And uh, it, it they served it, a very important purpose for a long time. It absolutely time. did because it was that was the confrontation, in the, you know, for a long time. That's what got that that that's what got me the ability to kind of go out and be a successful business person. And uh, if I wanted to, to have a career any place I wanted, any bank I wanted, join almost any country club I want. Uh, and it made this a secure world for my children and my grandchildren. And it was an important war. Uh, but uh, you know that war came to an end, and uh, but, 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 but you know people still wanted to fight a war when there were only confrontations. We have to give it up. Uh, you know we uh, uh, we have to bring in new you know new uh, new visions and and and, 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 and 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 new management today in the Jewish world. I, I know many of my friends may not like me saying this, but I've said to some of my friends that all Jewish leaders. Well, first of all, let me start back. Mo. You know the one way that. The best job you can have if you want to have longevity of the job is get a title in, in, in Jewish American life, okay? <laughs> because you get a job and you can't, you know, you go on forever, you don't get fired. But nowhere else, nowhere else in any mode of life, you know, especially in business, can you find that companies can prevail and continue to, to, to you know, to, to be successful by maintaining the same management and the same technology and the same, you know, the same product line? IBM eventually lost computers, you know, and Microsoft came, and today we got Google's. Well, in Jewish life, you don't get that. It's the same institutions with the same messaging, with the same, you know, leaders. And uh, so I've said to a few friends, I think all Jewish leaders should retire, and let's give young young people, I said, wow. including me and young people, a chance to, you know, to to to, to come in and show a new vision. You know, we have new presidents of the United States. We have, you know. You know, new companies growing all the time. Uh, the world is changing and evolving, and I think, you know. So the Jewish, Jewish institutional landscape could change also? It should change. Now, again, it needs to be there. I'm not one, one of those that thinks that we ought to limit it to one Jewish organization that, you know, to become sort of the court Jews. Um, and I think the leadership in the Jewish world is they're magnificent. They're, they're smart. They're talented. They've done a wonderful job. Really dedicated. Yeah, and dedicated. But, you know, just like at the American Jewish Congress, you know, the wars have changed. The, 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 you know, the structures need to change. The visions need to change. And, 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 and new people have to come in to, uh, you know, to, to do the battles that Jews need. And it's not the same battle as yesterday. It's new battles. It's similar to what I talked about in the Middle East. In that context, what's your sense of a new organization like J Street and what it's trying to do and whom it tries to represent. Are you critical of its being? And would you invite it into the overall Jewish tent and give J Street a seat at the table? Well, I, I, I'm opposed to J Street's position and, um, and their tactics, so I wouldn't want to give them a seat at the table. Um, uh, and uh, I think, you know, one of the one of the problems that we have is that, you know, every American president often needs to find a, a, a Jewish audience that um, will, 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 will adhere, you know, or will support certain policies. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, President Clinton did that. He, we had the IPF for a while, which I think may be out of business now. But you What know, was the IPF? You know, they were a liberal group of, you know, politically active, you know, uh, Jew, you know, Jews, and uh, you know, when, when when you try to take a different course, then then the community understands it for the moment, which is what the president did. You know, Oslo and um, and, and uh, you know uh, his last efforts with Arafat and, and Barack. And, you know, I think American presidents do what all political leaders do, and they find groups that support them. And I think what happened here was 
uh, J Street, you know, was taking you know, a, a, a much more you know liberal approach, and uh, it was expedient to bring them you know under the into the tent because you had another voice. But J Street ended up being much too uh, you know I think uh, erratic in their views, and uh, you know it didn't even look like I'm, I'm not sure they support. They look like they support the state of Israel. I mean I, you know, and uh, so uh, I think that they. That's, that's the reason they haven't succeeded of late. So. Among young liberals, there seems to be a distancing themselves from Zionism on the grounds that Zionism is no longer a liberal cause. And we saw there's still discussion about the Peter Beinart article in which he's arguing that the liberalism of your generation is not shared by the next generation, and that it's because Israel has been involved in a brutal occupation for, I mean, since the Six Day War of 67, has not been able to get out of that, and is in some way guilty of human rights violations that go against the liberal Jewish ethic. So, my last question for you, Jack what do you say about this tension between? American Jewish liberalism and the American commitment, the American Jewish commitment to Zionism. Well, I, 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 I think that it is unfortunate that when you, when, you, when, when, when you talk about these two positions that so, so few in our community are really engaged in even thinking about the positions. And having said that, what, you, what I think you get are, are you know, uh, activists, and it's a narrow, you know, it's a small group, a narrow group, who are, you know, taking different positions, which we always had. I just don't, I think the unfortunate part is that the overall Jewish community is just not engaged with Israel. I don't think they understand the difference of whether they're, you know, uh, liberal on the issues or, you know, whether, you know, the, the approach to Zionism is something that, you know, that's positive or negative. I think, I just think they're not engaged. So I think if you engage the entire Jewish community, uh, I think a, a vast, 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 vast majority, which would become much more moderate uh, and would not take liberal points of view. But like everything in life, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's usually a narrow group who, uh, you know, uh, takes the time and, and, and becomes the activist. So I, th I think we misrepresent the Jewish community. Are you saying, though, that Jews are less socially liberal than they used to be? Or you would have them be socially less liberal? I, 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 I think that, you know, the definition of, of, of Jews being socially liberal in a world uh, that, uh, that, that uh, was defined um, by, you know, a lack of, of, of freedoms and, and, and a lack of, of support for minorities and, um, and uh, you know, fit well for the Jewish community. It was our values, it was American values, and we were fighting that. Um, I, I'm not so sure that, that, you know, the definition of liberalism today is the same. You know, when we use social liberalism as a, by definition, I mean, we were talking about a time where, you know, um, depending on your color and your religion, mm -hmm. you didn't have equal rights. Well, we were very, very socially liberal. We were the leaders against, you know, in that, in that battle for those freedoms. You know, I think the world today, you know, just can't be defined that way, and therefore I, I'm hesitant to say that, that Jews are less socially liberal. I think they, have a, they don't have the same need to define themselves in that camp. If we were under attack today, if we didn't have our freedoms today, uh, if we didn't, we didn't have our standing today as Americans, as you know, we often didn't, you know, prior to the 1970s, I think we would still be socially liberal. But in a world where that's not an issue. Um, I don't know that that definition matter, you know, means the same thing as it does before. I think, I think we, we fit neatly into an American world today um, because we're not defined as a narrow minority in the, you know, daily activities. We don't have to worry about growing up as Jews. And, and uh, you know, less and less African Americans have to grow up, you know, being worried about their color. And we have a, you know, look, look at our president. So, 
So the definition of social liberal and what it meant before, again, uh, is something that you know may, may, maybe we shouldn't be, be thinking about in the same way. When you were 20 or 30, were you a liberal? I think any Jewish kid who grew up in the Bronx had to be liberal. I mean, a couple of a couple of folks went, went went astray, but you know, you 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 know. Okay, are you still a liberal? I'm, I, I am a liberal. Of course, you are. So that I'm surprised that you aren't comfortable with the phrase social liberal. Because I, you know, look, on the issues that are confronting us today, I, I would kind of call myself a centrist, okay? Um, if you ask me about, you know, look, what are we confronting? We're confronting a, a world of, you know, where Islamic fanatics are trying to, you know, take over the world and define the world for us and, you know, attack Americans and attack the West and Jews. Um, uh, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're confronting problems today um, that, that uh, to me, are, are not the, the kinds of problems that put you in a world of liberalism versus conservative on social issues. I mean, where, is the, where, where are the issues, you know? Uh, church state is, is, you know, as I said, is not a, a major issue today. Um, uh, equal rights for you know uh, for Americans is not an issue today. So, if those issues confronted me, I'd say you know I, I'm going to bang my, my my hand on the table here, and I am a, a, a very strong liberal. But you know, in the, in, do you want Roe v. Wade overturned? Absolutely not. Okay. Do, do I think it's going to get overturned? <laughs> Did you know that you know I always get this Roe v. Wade. <laughs> you, you know that that's you know Judge Ginsburg, Supreme Court ju Justice said that she didn't believe, and she's the most liberal judge on the Supreme Court, she made a statement where she said she does not believe Roe v. Wade will be overturned. Okay, good. Uh, okay, well, I point that out to you because I think, I think sometimes we're, you know, we should worry about it. We should defend ourselves. But my point is you do care. I do, absolutely. Okay, do. and at the moment, do you think the gay community should or should not have the right for civil unions? I think they should have the right. Okay, there, and should there be... Um, Strict gun control laws in this country. Yes, you're a liberal. These are still these are still issues, which could erupt at any time. They are. Yes, but you know, where am I on immigration? Um, you know, uh, there, there are there, there are issues confronting America that are front and center. Um, and, and do you want to give no? Amnesty? By the way, no, 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 no more or less important than Roe okay. v. Wade. Do you but, want to give amnesty to? Undocumented uh, immigrants. Uh, not You're without, not as liberal not, there as you right, might have been. Not, not without some some real, you know, uh, solving some real concerns and, and, and putting in place some real, you know, uh, protection. Uh, so the answer is on that issue. I may not be. You know, okay, I may so be, that's why you call yourself a centrist. Yeah, because I think those are the issues confronting us. We'll, we can go back to worrying about Roe v. Wade every day. And I, for those ladies who are watching, believe me, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I support I support it as much as any American would ever could ever support it. But you know, the, uh, at the moment, it doesn't look like it's in danger. Okay, uh, at the moment, you know, uh, I mean, we, we, we liberals are, are, are in power in Washington, and even when conservatives were in power, look, you had. George Bush was, was a conservative. He was president of the United States for eight years, and Roe v. Wade didn't have a challenge, in, in, you know, at the, in, at the Supreme Court, really. So, so the, so, so, so you know, the, what is confronting us is immigration, and and and, you know, to a lesser extent, Roe v. Wade today. So, how do you define yourself as as, a, as being a social liberal or not? Because mm -hmm. on these two issues, you know, you, I mean, the world. Is looking a little bit different than it did 20 years ago, and that's what I mean. That's the question I raise. Uh, um, and, and 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 you know, the battles that we won, I am as liberal as anybody is. You know, I grew up in that world where I had to be liberal. But on um, you know, but if if the battles confronting us are different today, then I think you know I could call myself a centrist, and I think probably much of the Jewish community would today. I think you're absolutely right. So, you know, I talk to a lot of people sitting at this table, and I have known of you, but this is the first time I've actually had a chance to speak with you. And I hope you understand what I mean when I say that whenever I interview somebody for the first time, 
I'm hoping I find them interesting. I'm hoping I find them thoughtful. I'm hoping I find them articulate. And I'm hoping I find them lovely. You are an absolute gem. I have rarely spoken to anyone who has not only the breadth of experience, but is able to articulate and think and has as lovely a way of presenting ideas as you. You are a, a treasure, and your sons and your grandsons and your wife Phyllis is a very lucky woman, and I've been extraordinarily lucky. I've been extraordinarily lucky to have this time to sit with you. I hope it's not the last time. You are a marvelous leader, and you know, for somebody in your position who has the, the ability to meet with the leaders of the world, and it comes because of the work you've done and the success you've had, but it also comes from your mind and heart. And I wish you kol tuva hatzlacha, only the best for you, Jack Rosen. You're really a treasure to the Jewish community. I thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself with our community. Thank you very, very much. Mark, thank you, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell uh, all my friends uh, in our community uh, a little bit about our experiences and how I see the world. And uh, I hope I was helpful, and uh, I'd love to be invited back. Thank you for saying that. And those were the thoughts of Jack Rosen, chairman of the American Council for World Jewry. I hope you enjoyed meeting him as much as I did, as always. I invite you to be in touch with us. With any thoughts or comments you may have to the ideas expressed by Jack Rosen, please email me or write me this week or be in touch with me through Facebook or Twitter. And if you want to be in touch with Jack, you can do so by emailing me and I will forward your emails on to him. I look forward to hearing from many of you this week. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who can send a tax-deductible contribution of $36 or more to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media to help support our programming. Tax-deductible checks may be made out to GEM and mailed to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. Please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD, and we thank you for your kind support.